see what you mean by the mining lights. Uh, who would have thought when I came to Poznan uh, in 2007 that I would be standing here on the stage talking about the phenomenal success of the BPO sector? So it's great to be here. Uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Franklin Templeton, our journey in Poland, and then talk about sort of what is from a market standpoint, and frankly, on my mind as an executive of a multinational company, what's on our mind, which is really disruption. Um, so just a little bit about Franklin Templeton. We're a, a global asset management company that started in 1954. We have 59 research offices across the globe and, and trading offices. Uh, we have sales offices in 37 countries, and we have clients in over 170 countries. Uh, we like to say that we have feet on the ground in 87% of the world's GDP, which gives us a great insight into global investing. Uh, today, we have $753 billion in assets under management. Franklin Templeton entered, Pos or entered Poland in, uh, in the 1990s really because we saw the opportunity for investments opening up in Central Europe, and, and in particular in Poland, and we made this our hub and, and, and built a research team here. Uh, today, we actually have 1.4 billion of our global investment money invested actually in Poland and companies in Poland. Uh, we then decided to, to start selling investment products in 2004 to domestic, to, to Polish people and selling them global products, and then in 2015, decided to enter what we call local asset management. So what's local asset management? It's usually selling domestic products, domestic equity Polish companies, or fixed income debt to the, those Polish companies to Polish people. And so we felt that this was an opportunity. We have about 15 local asset management companies across the globe. We decide to move into those markets because we see great growth and opportunity and a rising middle class. So that's what we saw about Poland, and that's why we entered it into 2015. Today, we are the largest cross-border, what they call cross-border, so I'll just say global product provider in Poland with a little over $800 million in assets under management here. So we then... We separate kind of what we do on assets under man or uh, an a uh, local asset management company from what we call a services company. And so, because we're a global firm, we looked at it and we we felt that we needed a hub in Europe to be able to support our business. Uh, it's a 24-hour clock, so we felt that having a, a strong services company somewhere in Europe made sense. We embarked in about 2006 to decide what market would make the most sense for us. Uh, and we selected Poland for our services company. Part of the, the initial attraction was for, because it was lower cost compared to some of the other markets we were in, although, frankly, the, the, the group that we had narrowed it down to was competitive on cost. And then it became, you're looking at regulation. We were very, very pleased with the various languages, language skills that we could get here to support our global business. And, and frankly, just the talent pool. You know, I, I'm, I'm not sure you guys are aware, but Poland was uh, the first country to actually create a ministry of education back in 1773. And it's, it's just a great educated talent pool. So today, we have uh, 851 employees in Poznan. One of the things that attracted us specifically to Poznan, even though we have a, a Warsaw office, uh, was because of the tremendous talent pool from universities, about 25% of uh, the employee base, uh, or actually even the population here, are uh, students. And so for us, that's a great talent pool to attract. And so we have just under, or just over 9% of our workforce, and this is our largest hub of anywhere in Europe today, is, is our uh, Poland office, is our uh, Poznan office. And it represents over 50 departments within the company. Essentially, every part of the business is represented here. So while you initially come, you know, and I think everybody's going to experience the same thing. You sort of come because you say, well, you're going to get core skills around talent and around, um, uh, you know, uh, from a lower cost and, and language and things, and then ultimately see what in tremendous talent and you continue to grow your business as an upscale. I don't think we knew that we'd have 9% uh, of our workforce here at the time we started, but, and we think that that will grow to another 1,500 people. Uh, so incredibly pleased with, uh, with our success here. And frankly, it's a testament to the employees in the firm how successful that's been. 
Now, I want to talk about just what is on uh, our mind as a firm and one of the real risks, and also is as BPO sector trying to support businesses trying to innovate, this is relevant to you because you can play a part of this. So the tremendous risk, in my 30 years in this business, I have never experienced change and pressure to change as we're experiencing right now. And that's standard across, I think, any industry. And if you don't feel it, then you probably have the real blinders on. And so the risk is, the way you've always been taught it as an executive to think about is you put, is be highly focused, put blinders on, and, and just look at your competitors, understand what your competitors are doing, understand what your cu customers' needs are, and, and solve those. The problem is, in the new world, that's going to be a risk. And so I'm going to give you an example here. It's not a perfect example, but it, because I can measure specifically the impact of disruption, it, it's at least put some context around it. So, in 1937, New York City decided we're going to regulate the number of taxis. So a taxi license in New York City uh, actually peaked in 2014 at $1.3 million. And it was perfect, right? Because you buy a taxi, you know exactly what your competition is. Maybe your income ebbs and flows a little bit by tourism. But your competition was you just had to beat the city bus, the subway, and maybe when the black cars were rented, but those were kind of higher end. And so it was incredibly predictable business case. And then what happens? Over time, somebody figures out with global positioning systems that you can actually generate a business model called Uber or Lyft, where people can on demand order cars, and people can, can, can suddenly compete with the New York City taxi in a way that nobody ever imagined when they were buying that for 1.3 million. So today, the medallion license has dropped by 82% in value to being just under $200,000. So from a business, the problem we all have is, where is that disruption going to come from? Now, I just want to show this about Jamie Dimon, because I'm a huge Jamie Dimon fan. I think he's a, he's a tremendous CEO, and because I had the same view. So this is one thing about, he said about Bitcoin, so Bitcoin is cryptocurrency built on blockchain. He said, if you're stupid enough to buy it, you'll pay the price for it one day. I completely agreed with him, because no country is going to ever give up control of their currency. It's one of the issues the euro has, uh, arguably, is that there can be different c competing uh, motivations by various countries. And then a year later, he says, you know, I really regret calling Bitcoin a fraud. Because actually, it's not quite just about currency, it's about tokenization of ownership and the speed of being able to transition ownership, potentially, of private assets. So it's different than he thought. So even though that technology was right in front of him, he couldn't quite see where it was potentially going. And then finally, oops, let me uh, meet the 29-year-old in charge of J.P. Morgan's cryptocurrency strategy. He had to finally capitulate and say, you know what, this is going to be real and we better do something about it. Another case of disruption, I just want to show this one, because actually this was a firm that figured out that they were being disrupted and actually responded pretty well. So Best Buy is a large electronics firm in the US with big brick and mortar. So you would go in and you'd buy it, you'd look at all the TVs and you'd pick your TV or DVD player. And so they were doing very well from the 90s, huge growth, and that is backwards uh, as a slide, but okay. Um, and, and so they had huge growth on their, uh, <laughs> this is wrong, okay. Just imagine that coming up the other way. So from the 90s until about 2000 and, I don't know, six or seven, they had tremendous growth. And then Amazon came in. And who would have thought that an online retail book would impact Best Buy so dramatically? Because what was happening was they were still getting people coming into the store, and they were looking at the TVs, and then they were saying, I like this TV, and they were pulling out their phone, and they were doing one click on Amazon, delivered to their home in two days. So Best Buy was spending the money of having the brick and mortar, and Amazon was getting all the profits. So the board of directors brings in a new CEO from the travel industry, who many people question. And he said, you know, we're going to reinvent ourselves. What do we have that are our strengths? One is we have a store. We, in the end, our clients still want to come in and compare TVs in person. So let's do a couple things. One is, let's make Sony and Samsung paying for the fact for shelf space that they can actually show off their TVs. 
So we're gonna turn this into almost a real estate deal and we're gonna make every electronics firm have to pay us for that shelf space. So whether or not they sell on Amazon or in Best Buy, we make money. Number two, let's compete head to head with Amazon and make sure that our websites is easy to use with one click. And number three, let's even do better than that. Let's recognize that we are omni-channel. Let's recognize that we have an advantage of stores and we have online. So if somebody buys something online and it doesn't work for them, let's let them be able to walk to it, bring it to our store and return it so that on Amazon they have to ship it back up and put it in a box and send it and wait till it comes back. And therefore we can beat the client's expectation. And then finally, let's train up our employees 125,000 employees, so they become consultants. So when the client comes in, the client doesn't say, you know, the client says, where are your headphones? The customer says, where are your headphones? They say, what are you going to use your headphones for? Do you want sound, uh, the, you know, the, the, what are they called, the, 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 what, that you wear on an airplane that reduces the sound? Or are you trying to, you know, use them for exercise, so you want light headphones? Let's talk about what you're trying to do. And let's reposition the store so the client experience ties into what you're doing. And now Best Buy is taking it to the final, which is they're actually now doing home delivery. You can pay Best Buy an annual fee to have them available to come and service your AV system at home. And so sure enough, their stock is right back up uh, and doing very, very well. So this is a, an example of a firm who took the disruption head on and said, let's make some change. Now, here's an example of, I just would ask the question of, is there a risk that disruptors are vulnerable to disruption and how quickly can that happen? So again, Amazon disrupting so many places. We talked about Best Buy. Again, I would say, you know, when you think about blinders, if you were in the commercial real estate business, chances are when the online book retailer of Amazon came along, you did not understand the impact it would have on commercial real estate which has been dramatic in the US because suddenly the malls are having to reconfigure because they're seeing stores close down. So Amazon was the big, big disruptor here. But then you look at Alibaba, which is kind of the Amazon in China. And you say, okay, in 2015, Amazon delivered 3 million packages a day. Alibaba to the 1.7 billion Chinese were delivering 12 million packages a day. On Cyber Monday, the biggest day on the internet in the United States, they were doing 37 million transactions. On Singles Day in China, they're doing 278 million transactions, but your middle class doesn't have quite as much to spend per capita in China, so good news is the revenue of Amazon at 89 billion was way more than the 12 billion uh, of, of Alibaba. Fast forward today, and Alibaba's online sales and profits have surpassed all U.S. retailers, including combined Amazon, Walmart, eBay. So just think about that model of disruption, that when you're narrowly focused, Amazon is focused on being able to compete with the, the, the current uh, competition, not always looking over their shoulder to see what's coming. And then I just want to bring up one other point on how, how we can think about it and how there's an advantage for those who don't have an incumbent view. So first of all, you hear a lot about you know, the, the self-driving cars, as a matter of fact, General Motors CEO Mary Barra said, hey, five years from now, General Motors is going to get more revenue from self-driving cars, from leasing a fleet of self-driving cars than just selling cars. And so if you think about that, and you can unleash yourself as far as, or unlock yourself as far as innovation so you don't have the steering wheel and others, you say, well, what, what's the new car going to look? Well, Mercedes-Benz has come out and said, you know what, here's what our new car is going to look like. And you know, as you can imagine internally, you can actually change your commuting because you can run a conference call and have meetings inside your cars and dramatically change it. However, if you actually go back to that, that picture for a second, which I guess I messed up, um, in the end, it still kind of looks like a car, right? I mean, you can actually imagine a car should be a circle and the, the wheels should be able to spin and it'd be much more efficient. But the problem there is every car manufacturer has a production line that they have a huge amount of capital expenditure already built into it, and so they don't really want to innovate that far, which is the great advantage to the disruptors who don't have that embedded. And I actually think for any kind of markets that don't have the, the current infrastructure, they will leapfrog the traditional developed markets that have built into this incumbent infrastructure because the incumbents fight very hard to change. At Franklin Templeton, 
We are very much aware of the disruption that's happening in financial services. This is just a, Franklin Templeton's headquarters is in the heart of Silicon Valley. And so we see these companies, this is just a snapshot, it's the tip of the iceberg, all put in categories around. And we're worried about and thinking about how can we be disrupted. And so I'm just gonna share how we're approaching it. So one is we said we have a three-pronged approach. So first of all, if we're in the investment business and our job is to find investment insights for our clients, then the traditional way that we found insights is probably not gonna be the way going forward. So if you think about, they say in, in 2017, more data was created that can be searched in the last 5,000 years. If you think of every one of those self-driving cars that's gathering huge amount of information around it, that that becomes information that ultimately can generate insights. So we're creating a data science hub that we will be able to support our investment, in, investment teams leveraging the great advances in technology around cloud computing, uh, the, the great advances in analytics, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, to be able to get those insights. So a couple of just examples that you would see is, historically you couldn't do analytics on, on video images. Well now you can actually, if, if you're not sure you're comfortable with what China's numbers are on projections, you can use satellite images to count the trend as far as the number of containers going on and off inside the ports within China. So that can give you additional insights. So we feel that that's very important to where, uh, you know, where, where we as a firm will be able to provide that uh, investment edge to our clients. Second is that we have a strategic investment pool. We're investing in companies globally that we think could be disruptive. Blockchain is going to be hugely disruptive to the, financial, the global financial services system. I just don't know if it's my problem or if it's my grandchildren's problem, but it is absolutely gonna be hugely disruptive. And so investing in a, in a blockchain company, what we do is we assign an internal person who is responsible for either being on the board or the advisory committee to understand how that technology evolves. Natural language processing, if you're making an investment, under, understanding social media sentiment is going to be important to have a perspective on that investment. Um, uh, you know, AI, obviously, another, robo-advisors. Our business, we, we leverage a network of financial advisors because we think advice is very important for an investor. But there's a lot of question about how much of that gets disrupted by being able to create a rules-based robo-advisor. So that's what our strategic investment pool is. And then finally, we're creating a rapid development center where it's carved outside of our traditional IT department because IT departments have a lot of reason why they have to follow a lot of rules because anytime you introduce change into an operating environment, you introduce risk and that can really damage a business. And so if you can ring fence your rapid development, you have an opportunity to be more innovative. Uh, if, if you think about it, if entrepreneurs actually had to follow all the procedures that an IT department follows, they'd probably never be able to launch a product. So by being able to carve something out and do the fail fast, we think we can get some edges around the innovation. And I'll sum it up with this, just one more thing. That's what Steve Jobs used to say, so I get to say one more thing, which is uh, because we're in the investment business, this is just a very important point to make, and I think it's, it, uh, you know, with all the discussion around pe pensions uh, is relevant to this market. So I'm just gonna give you two people, right? So Shishtoff and Joanna. Shishtoff starts to invest at age 35. He invests $5,000 a year for his retirement, for 30 years, so he invests a total of $150,000. Joanna starts to invest early. She only invests for 10 years, but she invests $5,000 a year for 10 years. Same amount of return, who has more money at retirement? Joanna has 11% more. Invest early, I promise you it will make a big difference as you get later in life. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention.